I'm David Marrock. I'm probably a couple of things different. Um, I'm the only CEO that I can actually see on the list of everyone who's been speaking and even attending. So I guess that makes, um, makes it something different. And the second thing that will make me somewhat different um, is that I'm probably going to talk on the softest side of the subject, um, which actually I think is the hardest side of the subject, which is about making change happen. And I'll talk about it from a number of different perspectives. First of all, a, a little bit of background on myself. As I said, I'm the CEO of a company called Charles Taylor. I'll tell you a little bit about it um, afterwards. In prior life, I actually worked in consulting. Um, I worked at McKinsey. I did uh, quite a lot of turnaround work in that environment, seeing companies bluntly when they have their lowest moments, and got quite a lot of insight, if you like, into one, how do companies get into those places, what happens, um, what the role of technology is in that space, if you like, and fundamentally how you make change happen. So. Um, I, I won't speak very long about us, but just so you're aware, because I, uh, I suspect this will be a part of the world that will be completely unfamiliar to you. Charles Taylor is, um, we are a dedicated specialist insurance services company. We do everything we do is technical. We have about, um, as you can see, about 1,800 people. We're in about 30 countries of the world. Um, and we are doing everything from running insurance companies to uh, dealing with large complex losses occurring somewhere in the world to a whole variety of technical services. And one of them, which clearly fits into what we're talking about here, is we have Charles Taylor InsureTech. Um, and within that, we have obviously all of our specialty, the, the, the people we have which are, know about insurance, but we also have a 200, includes 200 people who are dedicated around technology. And we provide a whole variety of services in numerous locations, working in partnership. And, um, and I'll talk a bit about some of these as examples when we're going through around making change happen. These are probably the most content-rich slides I'm going to use from here on. So, um, and I think that in itself will probably be a bit of a difference because having watched some of the presentations today, um, they were busy, lots of great content, but not always that easy to see. And I think I'm gonna start with a message that is almost in the level of blindingly obvious, but worth reiterating. We are in an environment where change is imperative to survive and you need to do so in order to succeed. And I, having grown up in the financial services space, perhaps we, we sometimes get accused that we are, um, I think politely people say we're a decade behind a lot of other industries, and it might be longer than that. So perhaps you might say, well, this message is already understood in the industry you're in. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about the challenges we face in, in, in the industry we're in, and perhaps you'll see connections to yours as well. Um, the first of is the speed of change. Um, as I said, insurance is certainly not known for being a fast-changing environment. It, it's probably an environment where you, you'll still find paper files all over the place. You'll still find people will resort to a, a meeting where they could easily have done a transmission of some sort. It, it is not that sort of technologically savvy environment. However, when I look out into the wider world, I think there are a lot of other sectors um, that bear this resemblance as well. But we are seeing now substantial change and being able to tackle that change is critical. The, I talk about barriers to entry coming down and again that's clearly happening in the insurance space. We're having competitors come in from numerous places. We're having money, capital flowing in looking for good returns and as a consequence entering and we have customers who are looking for a different experience. And when I talk customers here I'm, we're, we're more focused on the B2B space than the B2C, and in fact, in insurance, that, that, those are both pretty sizable markets. A lot of the discussion we've heard today has been on the B2C orientation, and I think some of those issues resonate, but actually others are quite different in the B2B world. And the first one, which is fundamentally different, certainly in financial services, and I, I, I listened to the discussion on GDPR, and don't get me wrong, GDPR will be huge in the financial services space too but it'll be one of a numerous regulations that have hit the financial services sector in the last decade or two. It won't necessarily be, it might be worse, it might be better, but my God, we are used, getting so used to that sort of ongoing regulatory drive. As a, cha as a change agent, it can be quite positive because it forces the companies to do things, but it forces you often to do things in the most obtuse way and it sucks up the budgets for change and as a consequence makes driving other types of change, some of the cool things we've heard about today, becomes all the harder. And that's where the sort of insured tech stuff that's happening 
is, is up against that sort of challenge. What we are now seeing is finally, in a, in a space that we're living in, we're finally seeing companies starting to embrace that change. And I, and I imagine if you think about your industry, you will, you will probably say there are some parts of it which have already embraced it, and there are other parts which still have quite some way to go. But as a consequence of some companies embracing change, it is forcing this topic onto the agenda in a way it was never before. So again, sitting certainly with a bunch of, CI, by and large, I assume, CIOs in the audience, um, it's, you could say, of course, technology is a key driver of change, and it's a core component of any program. I, I think, from my experience working with CIOs, is I think they often don't think the word is a key driver. They think it's the driver. And I think it's that differentiation that's quite important. The number of times, and we were listening to the presentation before, and it was discussing, if you like, the challenge between technology and marketing. And it, there was a sort of a mindset of, well, why don't marketing realize technology knows the answer? And I think it's the, we need to think about technology as, yes, important to driving, as part of driving change, but actually change happens by people. And a lot of the, the failures I've seen, and I'll talk a bit about some of those later, have occurred where the technology looks fantastic, but it completely disconnects from the people who are actually going to, whether they are they receptive to the change? Do they see the change as positive? Do they understand the change? Once it's happened, will they, will they find they'll use the system? How many systems can you think about in your own systems landscape do you have where most of the functionality has been switched off, isn't being used, bluntly is, 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 was a waste of time of development and a distraction from the business itself? So we'll talk. A little bit, I thought it would be a good reminder about why, you know, in terms of why change has picked up. You look at this is the first computer that came into existence. And when you had this sort of world and you were driving off a program, change was an incredibly slow thing to do. I mean, one, you, obviously it was a marvel at the time, but you can imagine when you were operating at that pace, people who were actually going to have to drive the change and live with the change had enough time to adapt to that change. We're now operating in a world where the technology is eating the world. It's this, you know, a sort of a slight adaption on the expression you may know of software is eating the world. But I think it goes much beyond uh, a pure software mindset. And I think as a consequence, this is impacting how we do, we drive change. Um, and a, a good example of where people talk about Uber as a great technological innovation. But when you actually go look underneath Uber, most of the technology, pretty much all of it, was there for quite some time. So it's not a technological innovation. The innovation here is actually the business side. It's actually that someone thought to take various pieces of kit, put it together, and then do, and, and you could challenge in terms of the method, but actually get out there and find ways to get it, uh, for get clients to buy into it, to, to download the app, to think it was great, to then drive for that change. You know, if you, that's not about technology. That's actually about the marketing, it could just as easily have been in the CMO talk rather than the CIO talk. And I think when you think about change as about, it's much bigger than the technology, it actually becomes much easier to drive the change and knowing which change to drive. So as I said, it is finally coming to the world of insurance. Um, I, I will talk about a few examples of things um, that are happening out there. Um, machine learning has become actually, at least as a topic, has become prevalent around the insurance space. Um, actual examples where it's being used are, um, are far fewer. Um, I, I go to enough of these events, I sit in enough discussions, I see people who have spent inordinate amounts building uh, innovation hubs and a variety of stuff, but actually there are still quite few examples where machine learning is genuinely being used in the insurance space. And when I say genuinely being used, I don't mean there is a case study or there's, there's a use case or whatever, your, whatever particular terminology you use but I mean actually fundamentally changing the economics of the business. Um, you know, we, we're doing something, and it goes to some of the themes where I talk about um, some of the stuff where people are starting to get cleverer. You're hearing about it in, in underwriting capacities. Again, where there are higher volumes where you can use it. Um, we're using it uh, on a data cleansing type, data learning type uh, environments. But, but in truth, it is still very early stages. Again, blockchain. Uh, the, the number of uh, events which I am seeing where people are talking about blockchain <clears throat> within the financial services space and the insurance, insure tech, fintech space 
you would have thought it is already prevalent. And yet I am still yet to come across a meaningful application of blockchain anywhere within, certainly insurance, in the insurance markets. Don't get me wrong, there are definitely people announcing it. I've seen the publicity, but I have yet to see it in making a, a major play. Which isn't to say that I don't think it will. I actually am pretty convinced that there will be a point where we will get traction on some combination, or I'll talk a few of the others, but we will get traction on these. Because if you, if you know the fintech space, it is, it is an environment where, peop, where knowing who you're dealing with and the un, knowing your customer, which is a key, key financial services matter, is absolutely critical. So if blockchain can assist in doing that, that would be fantastic. But as I said, it's not that the technology is not there. The blockchain technology is good enough what's out there already to do what probably we need to do. The real challenge is getting the businesses, consumers, clients, etc., to buy into it. Um, drones is probably of these um, that I've got on the list is probably about the most prevalent. Um, as I, ha I mentioned earlier, we have a, a loss adjusting business. Um, we're actually using drones um, to go out and assess large losses at in complex environments, chemical plants, uh, uh, crazy places. We, we, and, and there I'm seeing, but even there it's again, it's right at the edge. It's not, I'm not seeing it, although people are talking about it as the something you can use, we're just going to replace uh, adjusters and surveyors around your homes because people will just send drones. No, people aren't doing that. But they are being, we are seeing it again at the edge of our technological usage. But it isn't happening because the technology is there. It's happening because, bluntly, we've, in our example, we've got lots of engineers who are aviation engineers and they like, they're interested in drones. So they go off and say, how do I use it? And I think that's quite key to driving changes. You've got to get people excited, engaged by what you're trying to do. Um, again, Internet of Things, I have no doubt will be significant. Um, I speak to companies, we, we deal with a lot of marine and energy companies um, around the globe. People are fitting uh, sensors onto every aspect of their vessels um, that you can imagine. And clearly it should, at some point, make a difference in terms of how people buy insurance, how they, or more importantly even, how they deal with safety management, how they deal with a whole variety of things. But again, I think we're still at quite early days. It's talked about a lot. Every bridge has got a sensor, every vessel, every this, every that. But how much are people using that information and then how much is it turning into driving their safety management programs? I think it's starting to happen. I just don't think it's a long way from being prevalent. Um, flexible platforms, and I guess what I meant there, and the it's, it's, if you go with, you know, you look around the insurance sector, and I think uh, banking is the same. If people are operating on platforms that are typically at least one decade, if not many more decades older, and as a consequence, when you talk about all the WSI stuff, they can't work out how would they possibly link the WSI stuff with the platforms they've got. How will they pull out the data? Um, and use it in the way that uh, the, the clever segmentation type exercises when at the moment they can't access the data. It's actually, they're still trying to work out how to get themselves off those platforms um, before they collapse. So moving on to flexible platforms has definitely become uh, more prevalent, but it, it's a long, slow process as well. And then automation, again, I'm seeing the case studies, um, but I'm not hearing people fundamentally Change, materially ch changing the number of employees around automation. I, again, I must believe it's going to happen because there is the volume of activity, certainly in the sort of more volume lines within the insurance space. But, but again, very few meaningful case studies yet. Um, it's going to happen, but how long, who knows? So, talked about that. Um, I've started to hint around this, and this, I, I can't tell you how many large programs I've seen over the years which have failed. Um, and as I said, it wasn't because of the, the technology was necessarily the wrong technology, although sometimes that was part of the problem. But typically, it was linked to the, the, the fact that the business and the technology teams were just not engaging. There was no real interaction. There was not a proper understanding of what the business actually required. And then the technology, the CIO would head off on on a, a, a sort of an expedition to, to buy the, the biggest kit, the biggest program to drive the biggest amount of change, and the business would get disconnected. And then ultimately, and I mean, I, I mentioned this example because I think it's one of the more um, material 
um, and sadly for everyone who lives in the UK, was coming out of our pockets, an uh, example of a project failure. I mean, when you're spending 12 billion and then you throw it away, you know something's gone wrong. But as I said, it wasn't, this would just be, this is just one because it made the press. But when I looked around when I was doing turnarounds, the number of times I saw programs, hundreds of millions of pounds, and you'd go and you'd say, well, where's, where, where's, where's the software? Where are you using this? And you'd discover that it had become a throwaway. And the CIO would be exited, bluntly, and the next CIO would come in and say, I can't make that work. And everyone would you know, congratulate them for their brave decision, and they would start off on the next quest, if you like. And I think, I think we've got to think about why that's happening, and I don't think that's going away. It's, you know, all the cool stuff we've heard about today we've still got to work out how we make these sort of changes happen because a lot of organizations are still the big ones and the big organizations still need to drive this sort of change. So to me, this, this plays a, a fundamental role and it's an expression that can be used in a number of different ways. But I guess what, what I mean by this is that you can have the grander strategy. And as I said, I worked at a strategy consultancy and my God, you'd go out and you'd produce grand strategies and then you'd later wonder, why has it not happened? Why did it not execute? And the, you'd go and when you'd find out later, you'd really discover that there wasn't, there wasn't, the people didn't believe in it. The culture of the organization didn't actually fit the strategy or where you were going. There's a lovely example in the, in, as I said, in the insurance space where um, you, you see brokers would, would um, well, a company I'd worked with, this was in, the, uh, in Lloyd's Market, and the, they, they had, a, a, about a decade or so ago, they introduced an innovation, and the innovation was to put, uh, everyone goes to the Lloyd's Market, you, if you're placing insurance, you place it physically, you come to a, what's called a box, and you spend time with the underwriter, and you discuss your particular insurance matter, and you get, you, you try to place your insurance, the broker does that. And they put as an innovation a television or a camera that the broker could look and see if there was a large queue waiting at that line to, to, who were interested in, in potentially, so they could say, oh, there's a long line there, I won't go now, I'll go later when the line is short. And what they found is that there were quite a number of brokers who actually waited and looked for the long lines. They wanted to have part of, for them, part of their day-to-day their -day experience was the interaction with people in the queue. So not having a line was not seen as a positive. So sometimes what we think are great innovations doesn't fit the culture, doesn't fit what people are actually looking for, and what people are remarkably good at is finding creative ways to work around the system if the system doesn't suit the culture, doesn't suit what suits them. And that's particularly when you're operating in professional environments, you see that all the more prevalent because bluntly they're more sophisticated, they've got the education, they've got the alternatives, and they find a way. So, there was a comment in the previous one, a question around asking about the, the role of the CIO. And I think, you know, to me, um, there are quite a number of the, the obvious roles which you'll be very familiar with. But I, I think the, the number one role for the CIO is to really get the business and technology to join up. And, and that sounds, of, well, you must be thinking, well, of course, I, I join up with my business. Of course, I talk to my my, my, the business and I found out the needs and I've got a business partners and the business partners spend time, you can easily put that sort of stuff in place. But the real fundamental question is, does it really feel like if you were a third party looking in on, on your situation, would they really see you and the business leaders as a, as a joined up entity or would they see you as a supplier to be hammered when things don't go right? And I think if you, if you can get this side right, and this is everything from the social, being seen as genuinely part of the team. When, when the business leaders describe their team, do they talk about you, the CIO, as part of that? Do they see the solution as their solution, their, as in our solution, joined up? Or do they see it as your, your solution to their problem, if you like? And getting that joined up experience between the businesses or the, func and the functions and the, the, the technology team is absolutely critical. And having people within your team who understand that, having people who've been in both locations, if you like, both, both roles, is quite fundamental. In my experience, I see very few times do I see people in either the business who came out of 
the, the technology side, and even rarer, do I ever see the reverse? Um, and that's quite, you should think, well, why is that? What is so special about technology that someone who hasn't grown up in it couldn't find a way to be useful in it? Just a, it's worth thinking about it, because if, if you keep those worlds separate, you can't begin to think that you're going to understand your clients, and your clients are going to understand you, and you're genuinely going to feel like you're in it together. The next one isn't, goes beyond that. And I, I, I think I've seen too many big companies, if I go over the years, and particularly in consulting and in various, various roles since, who actually think they, they're big enough, they don't need any help. They don't need to collaborate with partners in outside organizations. They've got all the skills, all the capabilities in-house. You know, it's almost one of the advantages that we're, we're a, you know, relatively at least, well, you know, it's all a, a relative game, but we've, we're a relatively smaller company, you know, just under 2,000 people. But part of our culture is we know we've got to partner. We know we can't get anything done if we're not meaningful, if we're not going to partner with people to make it happen. So it's in our culture, and therefore we naturally do it. And I think you see a lot of smaller organizations just naturally partner, not because they're better, but just because they have to. But as a consequence, they are much more likely to get the right partners into the room to actually get a better, more successful outcome. You, one of the challenges with the big organizations is there's this desperate desire to say, well, we've got to own it, we've got to control it, it's got to be ours, it's our IP, we've got to have our lawyers in place with the longest contracts you can ever imagine. And by the time you finish, innovation is dead. Because one, what are the chances of all those the right components sitting in your own organization, typically quite slim, and then being able to get it to work with that sort of mindset is going to make it really, really hard. It's interesting because I've, you see counter views on this one. I'm probably still, maybe I feel old school almost, but um, I'm still quite a big believer in things like budgets and, you know, actually working these things through, thinking about business cases. I, you know, I hear, I spend a lot of time with the technology folk around um, Agile, and I'm obviously, you know, I like Agile as a methodology. It's great. Um, but I think it can also run the risk of being an excuse for not thinking through what are you actually trying to deliver because it's, oh, we're going to be so agile. We'll just work it out as we go along, which is great until you get, you've, you've, you've now blown the budget and you're still only halfway up and the, the front end isn't delivered. But what you've built was fantastic and exactly what your clients wanted, but actually they wanted the whole thing. And getting that thought process through, which might feel, as I said, quite dull and quite traditional with, within the context of an innovation discussion, I think is still key. What this can't become, and it, maybe I'm demonstrating where my affinities lie, it's the, the other side, which is the Prince 2 type technology. And maybe I'm out of date, maybe there's a Prince 3 by now, but the, the sort of, you know, that sort of, I, I can't even remember, PIDs, I think, if I recall right, these long, voluminous documents that I have never yet seen anyone in a client side read. So they are produced allegedly for the client to confirm that this is what they want, and yet no client has the stamina or the, or the, or the attitude to read that sort of document. They, I, I found it quite interesting coming as a consultant. Is you, you know, we grow up with PowerPoints and, bar, you know, and flow charts, and that's, that's, be, you know, that's, that's just comfortable stuff, and most people in IT will do exactly the same. You, you're talking to, and you heard it in the presentation before, you're talking to someone in marketing or in a business environment, that's completely alien. You've left them behind. Not surprising, they have no idea. And then when you're trying to check, have we, have we understood, have we got agreement on what we're trying to do here? And they nod because they're thinking the alternative is you're gonna ask them to actually read that document. Of course they're going to say yes. <laughs> and then you're gonna get the type of projects we've talked about already. So um, a, few, a few sort of, um, these are probably high-level stuff. Nothing. I won't, uh, they're either profound or, or inane. You can make your own choice. Um, but about thinking differently, as I said, innovation I think gets bandied around quite a lot. Um, I, I, I think it can it can make it sound like innovation has to be the cutting-edge technology type stuff. To me, innovation is just taking anything that people are doing today and just doing it differently. That's better. That makes, whether it's lower cost, cheaper, easier, lower risk, doesn't matter, that's innovative. And I think if you redefine that term to be something less grand than 
we've just invented something that no one's ever thought of anywhere else, done anywhere else, which is a bar so high that no company just about, with few exceptions, can be truly innovative. You, you, make, you make it alien in your organization. You already put people off from doing that. So one of the things that we've driven in our organization is just to create an environment where people, doesn't matter who you are in the company, you've got an obligation to think of ways of improving how you're doing stuff. And if you can do it, if it's, if it's only you or a few people around you affected, you just do it. If it's wider, you, you involve people wider. If it's, if it's particularly significant and it's obviously, as I said, we operate in a highly regulated environment and it's going to have regulatory change impacts, clearly you've got to t make sure you're doing the right thing. But creating an environment where people aren't trying to create something that's never been thought of before, but are just trying to improve how things are done, creates quite an innovative environment and allows you to, to, to be building and developing at a, at a pace that probably your organization, if it, if it isn't doing something like this, hasn't done before. Um, it was quite a neat little thing I came across um, around a, an innovation cycle, and it just reminded you, if you like, um, or reminded me as well, that at different stages you're looking for different things, and it starts off from the sort of, I'm always nervous of created words, um, but like ideate, um, which I guess was coming up with ideas, um, create, pilot, and that's where people often think um, a lot about, when people are talking innovation, they're talking often about something really whizzy on that side, but actually most of the stuff that really helps us, that really drives change in most businesses that I, I see, are the stuff as you move across. It's where you actually have some technology or you have some capability and you find it's only being used in one part of the business. It's incredible. Something really, really clever, works well, has been tested, and only one part of your business, and particularly if your group is, um, you know, has more, many business units and they're relatively independent, it, you, you, if you go looking around, you will find numerous examples in your group. I've yet to find a group for this, which this isn't true, where they have something which is already working, already tested, not particularly brand brilliant or new, but actually is saving money, delivering better service for clients or for internally or externally, and it just isn't being deployed more widely. Um, exploit is a version of the same, leverage and repurpose, and those are all just trying to make more of all the assets you've got. And when I say assets, I don't just mean the technologies, it's the whole capabilities that go much wider than that. So this is where I really head into um, the, more, the more sort of um, imaginative, take it where you like it, you know, this is the world, I'm coming from the insurance space, this is as good as it gets, I'm afraid, in our world. Um, so, but I, I thought they were kind of, if, as I said, if, they, if, you, if you take anything out of this, it's sort of a thought process, you sort of say, that, was there anything I learned today, outside of my presentation, hopefully, that, that you say, well, that'd be quite good, this is where, this is the sort of, let's ch challenge yourself, you know, th this is where most people operate, it's in their comfort zone, and I don't just mean it's both your clients, it's often yourselves, it's what are you doing, which is just comfortable, it's the way you always do it. And I, always, I thought this was quite funny, it made me laugh, as I said, thinking about, well, the magic typically doesn't sit there. That's, the comfort zone is normally means you're going to do what you were doing and doing it again. So you've got to be challenging yourself, where am I expanding myself into a different space? Um, this was quite an interesting um, little, it was a survey that was done a piece of research quite a number of years ago, going back to the sort of late 60s, and the research was around creativity. And this uh, researcher in the States did, did a piece of research, looked at, uh, tried to understand, if you like, how they could identify creative people, and then went and used that, effectively adapted that research and used it with NASA as part of their recruitment process to try find more creative, more innovative engineers to join NASA to help it as part of they were doing the research. And then um, I think with curiosity went and tested the, the, the research and to see how that research would then be translated when they looked at just general population. And they tested, I think, children at about five years, five years old and they found about 98% or some ridiculous percent could demonstrate, the create, could meet the match of the requirements of the test for creativity. And then they looked at 10-year-olds and 15-year-olds and eventually got to adults and by the time you get to adults, it's about 2%. And you could say, you know, it's quite a stark thing because you think what happens between five years and becoming an adult that effectively 90 plus percent of the people who are clearly quite able to do creative things, because they were, become effectively under this test, become un 
I don't think it's such a word, but effectively become not creative, if you like. And I think challenging yourself to think about well, what is it that's holding you back from being creative. And in, as I said, in my experience, it's not that people don't have ideas. It's actually that people get intimidated. It's that people think, well, that's not innovative enough, or it's a stupid idea, or it doesn't, it's not going to work, or someone else tells them it's not going to work, or it's been done before. And if we can think about how we break through that mind block, um, it's rather powerful. Um, hence, breaking free, looking outside the box, be bold and be brave. And then a test, not just of your creativity, but also of your eyesight. Um, a, a bit of a quote around think, different, think differently, um, because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Um, but anyhow, so as I said, probably the light, hopefully the lightest um, presentation of today, but actually, as I said, probably the hardest one as well. Happy to take any questions.